Hello and welcome to Black Queer in the Archive, the third event in the launch of Lawrence Wishart's new Radical Black Women series in partnership with the Black Cultural Archives. My name is Jamana, I'm the books editor at Lawrence Wishart and the creator of this series. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to briefly introduce the series and the event moderator, and then I'll move on to today's panelists. The Radical Black Women series is a new book series that seeks to spotlight the contributions of black women to social justice movements in Britain. It was born out of a desire to redress, if even in a small way, the lack of resources available on black British history in general and black women's history in particular. The first book in the series is a new edition of Claudia Jones, A Life in Exile by Marika Sherwood with a new preface by Lola Lufemi, who will be joining us on today's panel. We're offering attendees of this event 25% off the book with a discount code Claudia Launch Event, which is valid until the 10th of October. We'll put the code up on the screen a couple of times during the event, so do make sure to head over to lwbooks.co.uk to get your copy. So with that said, I'd like to introduce the moderator of today's event, Rudy Lowe. Rudy is a visual artist and arts educator engaging in critical social issues through painting and drawing. Their practice interrogates what has become truth in the collective memory, envisioning alternative futures that center black and queer and trans experience. Hi, Rudy, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'll move on to our next panelist, Anya Keigwe. Onyeka is an artist and researcher working between cinema and installation. Through her work, Onyeka is animated by the question, how do we live together? With particular interest in the ways the sensorial, spatial and non-canonical ways of knowing can provide answers to this question. She uses embodiment, archives, sensorial, spatial and non-canonical ways of knowing, um, narration and text to produce structural figure of eights, a form that exposes a multiplicity of narratives. Anyeka, thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Our next panelist is Lola Lufemi. Lola is a black feminist researcher and writer from London. Her work focuses on the use of the feminist imagination, its relationship to futurity, political demands, and imaginative revolutionary potential. Her latest short, Red, was shortlisted for the 2020 Queen Mary Wasafiri New Writing Prize. Along right, alongside writing, she facilitates feminist reading groups, sorry, she facilitates reading groups and workshops, occasionally curates and is the volunteer coordinator of the Feminist Library in South London. Hi, Lola. Hello. And finally, Adamu X. Adamu is a darkroom fine art photographer with over 25 years experience in museums, galleries and alternative spaces worldwide. Ajamu is also a radical sex activist, independent scholar and co-founder of Ruckus Federation and the award-winning Ruckus Black LGBT Archive. His work includes portraits and self-portraits that unapologetically celebrate Black queer bodies, the erotic senses, desire and pleasure as activism. He's also a leading specialist in Black LGBTQ history, heritage and queer cultural memory in the UK. Thanks for joining us, Ajamu. Hello, thank you. Um, so I'll leave you in Rudy's capable hands. I'm really looking forward to the discussion tonight. Thanks, Jemana. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Really looking forward to having this chat with you today. Um, so I'm going to ask some questions and then we can open it up to uh, questions from the audience and kind of see how we go. So first of all, I just wanted to ask you all about your relationship to or your work with archives. Um, maybe we can just start with Onyeka. Sure. Um, I guess I have like two um, relationships, <laughs> two archives that have a concurrent, like happen at the same time. Um, I finished last year a long term like research project that was part of a PhD looking into um, British colonial film archives with the kind of question about whether it is possible in reproducing these archives to in some way um, move them or change them from their kind of like their initial intention. So the archives that I were looking at were made by the British state um, for and about um, the colonies. So these films were like incredibly 
um, racist and colonial. So I was like trying to figure out if it was possible to like reproduce these images and, and still and some uh, reproduce these images, but not reproduce the kind of intentions or ideologies that went with them. Um, because they're some of the kind of um, earliest images in cinema history, for sure, of um, people from Asia, Africa and the Caribbean. So at the end, I guess at the end of that research, my relationship to that archive is one of increasing ambivalence, I guess. Mm. Um, but also I've been involved in quite a lot of kind of counter archival projects um, that kind of focus on histories that are less prominent in the official archive. So in particular, I've done quite a lot of work with June Giovanni and her Pan-African Cinema Archive that I guess is a kind of a counterpoint to the colonial film archive that I was looking at. Great, thank you. And um, yeah, the same question to Lola. Um, I think that my relationship to archives is a kind of slippery one. I, I guess like in the work that I'm doing in, in my PhD, I'm basically looking at the relationship between the imagination and black culture production. So I'm looking at how, uh, what the cultural production of organizing groups or political movements can tell us about, what, what it can tell us about how they were imagining the future or how they conceive of their long and short term po political demands. And I'm, I'm trying to do that through archival material. And so I guess my relationship to archives, I would say hopefully is one of possibility and one that is like based in a, a, a fragmentary methodology. So I, I'm not interested in, um, trying to combat erasure or trying to, I guess, fill the, the gaps in history through um, the archive, because I guess following Sidia Hartman and others, I think of the archive as a, as a tomb of state documents in some sense, right, as an official history. And so I'm thinking about the ways that we might use archival material to um, elucidate or um, get some sense of how people were thinking in an effective way. So, so what can be kind of taken from the archive in an emotional sense? How can we get some sense of um, the political possibility that is stored in archival material? Um, and so for me, my, my kind of engagements with the archive so far have been trying to get um, uh, a sense of them that is based in affect and emotion, a sense that's based in um, uh, what does this ephemera, what possibility does this ephemera hold for uh, helping us rethink the past, present and future and also helping us kind of get past this um, or see past the impasse of uh, uh, our current, the, the current kind of uh, political imposed limits on what is possible. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm hoping that the archive, for me at least in, in the work I'm doing, um, enables a new um, dimension or, or, or a new way of seeing um, that helps us rethink temporality and helps us rethink um, the, how our demands are um, uh, kind of put forward. And, and in a way, it helps us, I think, hopefully, um, relearn a kind of political determination, right? So that we can see material in the past where people were hoping, thinking, wishing, and we can say, despite the limits on our political um, possibilities in this moment, we can also wish, hope, and think in the same way. Um, and that ushers in a, a, a liberated future in some sense. Great, thanks. There's lots of little, um, there was lots of threads there that I want to come back to. Um, but first, yeah, Jamu, if you could also answer the same question. I'm not sure how I can follow that, actually. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I think for me, I, I kind of move in between the physical archive and the conceptual archive. And so I'm, I'm a lot of my thinking over the last few years since I'm, I'm co-founding the Ruckus Black LGBT archive, along with Topper Campbell, is to rethink what is the archive? I'm, I'm, where and when is the archive? I'm, how I'm, we talk about, I'm, archival pleasure. I'm so I'm actually, and I'm part, part of the work is, isn't actually a pushback 
against how I hear uh, some of the concessions around Black Queer Archives. And so actually, for me, it's I'm not about what the Black Queer Archive includes, even though, I think, even though that's important, it is what is excluded from, from, from the archive and then what kind of narratives and, and I'm experiences a Black Queer Archive is excluding from Black Queer Archives itself. And for me then, there is then um, um, questions around um, archival pleasure and the um, archive that embodies some best actually, um, if I touch the flyer from the first Black Gay Men's Conference in 1987, that flyer also touches me. And that means then we have to then have a different conversation around tactility and touch and sensation um, materiality and matters. I'm so, so, so I'm asking me a lot of the conversations around the Black Queer Archive kind of misses out the actual um, archives on um, aliveness. The archive is also doing something irrespective of my encounter with the archive. So, actually, um, a lot of my thinking is also very conceptual as well. So, so basically, I'm saying that the archive is I'm not just a place that we can go to, it is that as well, but I'm saying that the very notion that the Black Queer body is the archive, if I'm archives hold memories, Black Queer bodies are archives themselves, and that means then the conversation is then more fleshy and more sensuous and more sexy and then more playful, and, and so that's where I kind of coming from the archive and I'm basically as an artist I also have more of a, a privilege to play around with this nebulous thing called the archive. I love the way that you talk about it because it yeah I really always almost feel like I can taste it when you talk about yeah. it like it starts you know the words that you use it starts to really bring on a like physical sensation um yeah, I mean, I love thinking about archival pleasure. I think I would love yeah. maybe to explore that a little bit more. And there was also something that you said, Lola, about imagining the future that made me think, I was gonna ask about how we navigate these spaces as well, that, you know, to think about um, at least some of these spaces and, you know, Onyeka, you also touched on about, you know, these state archives um, to access some of these spaces that were never really created for us. And so, you know, also thinking about the Ruckus Archive being at, um, at London Metropolitan Archives, how do we, if we look specifically at state archives, and that's for just first of all, you know, how do we navigate some of these spaces that never really had us in mind? In, in the creation of them in the first place. So I don't know if there's anyone who would like to speak to that first. Sure, I mean, I think I just rem <laughs> reminded that I used to do this thing, probably shouldn't say, but anyway, um, where every time I used to go into one of these archives, I would like take a pen or take a photograph <laughs> or like just do something that I wasn't quite um, allowed to do. Um, mm because I felt, yeah, as I think there's this Dale Lewis quote about presence, about what the presence of certain like people in certain places means. And I definitely, you can definitely feel that in certain state archives when you feel very surveilled and observed as you're like looking at this material and sometimes you're not allowed to touch it. But like, what does it mean to just like, when they're not looking, take touch this paper or like bring it to your, face and smell what it smells like like I always try and do things like that because like yeah in total agreement with um what Jamie was saying but the, there's a pleasure that you get that I get from like touching material and from thinking about who was there and who made it and how they made it um how they wrote what mood they were in what they were eating like those kind of imaginings for me are really present whenever mm -hmm. I do any kind of archival research so I think it's important to let that come through in how I'm thinking about the material so it's not just oh I'm looking for something I'm trying to find something out I'm really kind of connecting with it in a way and I think to try and break out of the rules of how you're yeah. 
to behave in these spaces or how you're supposed to receive these material for me allows me to feel my presence in the space as 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 myself rather than reproducing these kind of typical ways that people think about knowledge and archives and what it is to think about the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think the role of um, imagination as I've got to be kind of key to how we re-engage with the archive, it's actually, I think, it's because the archive is I'm um, usually read through its social and cultural lens I think that actually it does always allow space for um, imagination, fiction, myth-making, probably hearsay and probably gossip as I'm a form of um, social history as well. So really, I think that there has to be other ways that we can fuck with the archive, basically. Yeah, I'm, 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 because I'm, I think that a lot of the really great work around the archive over years the archive has become almost sacred actually and so i kind of like the, the fact that actually we can play around with these uh, histories and stories in all kinds of ways it was actually i think that if we are talking about black queer archives each black queer archive however it's formed has got to also um, contest or the black queer histories too, just so that we are, then don't have this overarching, there's one black queer narrative or one kind of black queer archive. And they've got to be um, in tension with each other. And for me then, it's what does that, that tension, in, in imagination then brings up um, archive of trouble is key as well actually. <laughs> and next to um, archive of pleasure, so yeah. I think for me, um, just to, to echo what's already been said, I think I, I think about the imagination as a process of bringing that which did not like previously exist into being. And I think the question of navigation in relation to archives is, is a complicated one because in a ways it's twofold. It is one recognizing that sometimes the material that we're trying to access is gate kept by institutions, right? So when we're in the space, what physically can we do, to, like Onyeka said, to you know, have an encounter with the material. But I also think there is, in in terms of um, our approaches to the archive, there's lots of space there to think expansively about how we take in this material and how we analyze it. And I, I'm thinking a lot about like um, Nadia Swabi and uh, Chandra Frank's mm. um, uh, 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 journal the in yeah. the feminist review where they yeah. you know, talk about like archival disorientations and this idea of as a, as a method reading against the grain and that means like taking what is scattered what is left in the archive and following like treating that material as if it was serious rather than you know just a throwaway piece of like whatever and I think in my in the work that I'm trying to do I'm I'm really interested in in what is seen as unimportant or like the scraps of paper or yeah. I've I, recently I've been I went to the VCA and I, I was going through Stella Dadzi's um, archive and looking at um, uh, material related to like OAD and Black women's organizing and there's so much like scrap paper and that for me yeah. is like where I want to begin rather than the kind of official documents because I think that that's that provides a mode of navigation that allows us in ways to bypass being um, gatekept by a specific institution or allows us to start a, a new conversation um, or propose new ideas about um, what's you know not only what is important material but um, what gets analyzed what what is seen as um, uh, uh, material that can tell us about tell us something serious about the past and I really take like a Jami's provocation about like gossip and there, there was so much when I in my interactions with archives I'm like wow that everybody was kind of fighting nobody really liked each other and that's that seems like an important thing to draw out in lots of different ways and so I think I guess to, to return back to the question I think that um in our approach to archives we have to be you know, as queers, like interested in mess, interested in um, yes, yes, not having yes. like a neat methodology, interested in 
you know, having to having a, a methodology that is in itself multi-directional. I think that for me is like how I'm trying to navigate it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I think kind of I'm the, the online question around institutions is I'm, for me, in terms of some of the work I've, I've done as well, there's also your know, black institutions and queer institutions too, that I'm also gatekeep as well. And so actually, I, 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 basically, I feel like we also have to have those kind of conversations is because then that's when it then gets really messy in terms of who is included in black histories and, and our black histories normally exclude your black queers and then your wider LGBT I'm, 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 I'm social and cultural history normally always exclude black folks anyway, right? And then also then I would then say within that also some black queers also exclude other black queers as well. After that, once again, I'm, I'm, I think that we could spend a lot of time talking about the institution, but my thing will, my thing will always be, you know, what are black queers doing around our histories and, and I'm archiving every single time. And then I think for me, that work has got to be front and center because I think that the institutions don't have to do that work. So then, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm not trying to say that we don't engage with them in all kinds of ways. I'm still saying that actually, I think in this country, we still have to build other kinds of black queer archives, right? Yeah, just, just so that we have, they don't have one or two, and but we have multiple. And then because actually, I think at this moment, I'm, I'm a lot of the work that I hear around black queer archival practices still seem to be London centric. So naturally, and we have to then think about the archives into the other parts of the UK and where there's black folks too. So then once again, I'm, I'm, that's the work of the archivist networks and communities, not the institutions. Because actually sometimes, even though I'm, I'm, I'm Ruckus lives at the LMA, right? Yeah, I, I'm, a thing was, and that was the right place for us to put it, right? Yeah, right. It's because the archive under my bed is serving no purpose. <laughs> so then, and I, 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 I question that we spent months and months talking about Master Photographer is where shall it go? And the question was, who was doing the work? Yeah. And some of your black, black and interested were not doing that work. And then they've never done that work, yeah. And some of your LGBT, I remember going to one office and they had a, an A4 folder of black and brown and they were proud as punch. I'm like, you can't get it neither. So then once again, sometimes the safest place might be those very same is that we still have to quest, question and challenge at the same time that they house it and care and care for it as well. And then that's the rub and that we have to kind of, kind of deal with, I think, around this thing called um, black, the Black Queer Archive, or Black Queer Archives. I love that you all really like touched upon the fact as well that I think maybe something about being black and queer allows also for bringing back in some subjectivity, the messiness, that the, the body cannot be separated from this space, that everything, you know, comes back to it on this level. And um, yeah, the idea that we need to have this multiplicity in the narrative and that that is also, you know, a really big part of it. Whether or not um, those different narratives match up, it doesn't matter, that we yeah. need that. And that's, a bit, you know, I think that's, um, yeah, that's really an important. And just kind of to speak to what you said, Ajami, as well about, what a difference it sometimes makes in some of these institutional spaces, who is there, um, yeah. that all you need really is one person who's really willing to go above and beyond to do the work. And that makes a massive difference to what can happen in some of yeah. those spaces. Um, I kind of wanted to go back to one of the questions as well that I was thinking about before, which was, um, I want, originally I was going to ask about what does it mean for you all to find black queers and histories in the art 
to find black queer lives and histories in the archive. But I guess also because you've all spoken to what it kind of does to you on this level of the body, I'm kind of interested to kind of bring that element in as well and think about, you know, when you find these histories, maybe sometimes in spaces where you don't expect to find them or like yeah. in collections where you don't, you're not necessarily looking for it, but when you find them, you know, maybe speak to a bit of that experience as well, you know, finding these, um, yeah, just finding it in spaces that you weren't necessarily looking for it. I think, um, I think for me, uh, those encounters, I guess for the purpose of like my PhD or the purpose of my thinking, I'm, I'm interested in how they shift us like ideologically. I think that beyond the kind of like framework of re representation, so beyond this idea that it just feels good to see yourself in specific spaces, I think that um, especially with material that is based in a specific kind of politics, so especially when you're working with material that, you know, emerges from the, you know, um, the various formations of like gay liberation groups, black um, uh, liberation, groups, black gay liberation groups, etc. Um, I think that it shifts our idea of like, or at least for me, it constantly shifts my idea of like what is possible, but it also constantly shifts um, uh, my that like my capacity to to demand uh, or my capacity to believe that the world could be organized in a different way and I think that often when we talk about like at least for me the relationship between theory and practice we talk about that obviously as an in connect, um, interconnected thing but we don't um, spend much time thinking about uh, the ideological and effective shifts that are necessary um, and allow us to behave as if it were possible to transform our material conditions. And that's that's a, that's something that I, I'm constantly kind of coming back to. And I think the archive is an endless, in ways, many ways, like um, an endless source of trying mm. to get that like political determination back. Because often, you know, people, people are, are asking questions about um, the status of, of black gay lives in the UK in the contemporary moment and how that's different from the past or how it's the same. And the same questions are asked around a lot of like political um, uh, 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 questions as well. And I think we constantly come back to this thing of like nothing's changed, nothing has improved, right? So the contemporary seems like um, this this place that is an impasse, this place that is we're, we're constantly stuck, like stuck. And I think the archive helps us unlock that by saying, these are what people did. This is the tenacity of their imagination in the past. And how does that inform our, our thinking now? But also like, um, yeah, what does, it, what does it do to us materially? I think and like um, in the work that I'm doing and the writing that, that I'm doing, I, I have this thing about like, I think when people come into contact with this material, they're changed in some way. And that change is actually a really important one in terms of their outlook or their ability to think about the, um, their lives in relation to others. And that's, I think, a really important political principle. Um, I was gonna say, I think it, like to answer your question, it comes back a little bit to this idea of pleasure because like working with colonial material, when you when I have experienced some kind of recognition or some kind of like way in which I'm like going past what I'm supposed to be presented with and like accessing something that's a bit like um not supposed to be there then it, it does feel like recognition and it and that is quite a pleasurable and powerful feeling um that is quite like moving actually really um so there's like that's one side of it but like I also think I did some work like maybe a very, no, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I think maybe it was like five or six years ago working on um, a film about the the Black Lesbian and Gay Centre uh, with Ronda, Veronica McKenzie called Under Your Nose. And I was just like kind of, I didn't know anything about this history at all um, at the time before I participated in it. And I just was like, what? <laughs> How is it that I don't know anything about this? And not only were we looking at archival material, but we actually were talking to people. Um, and it made me think that, you know, this is a history that is not long ago. People are still around. Um, and that gap in kind of 
knowledge between different generations became like mm-hmm. very very present and I don't think that necessarily I didn't think that everything was the same but I felt this kind of circularity to what was happening then and what is happening now and perhaps a connection to what's happening in the future and it felt to me like this urge to kind of make these kind of connections um felt like a felt very very strong I think from that experience and that's kind of something that's happened to me when, when working with June's archive looking at kind of the black workshop films from the 80s from Sankofa or from Black Audio or from Retake um, or watching like a Menelik Shabazz film or um, a, uh, a Julia Till film. So it makes me think that there's these continuations I want to kind yeah. of like interrupt or like access in, in some way. I'm, I'm, I think for me kind of I'm, there's always traces whether it's past, present or future, if it's actually, I don't think that past, pre- present or future is separate anyway. I think kind of the, the, and the archive of the Black Queer, the, the Black Queer archive actually installs all of that at the same time as well. And, and so I, I think for me, and then, the, and there has to then be a question of how does one learn to look? How does one become attuned to the archive? Can one hear the archive? And then sometimes actually, and we actually might not recognize this thing called black and queer in in, in, our, in archives. If actually the question is, what are we looking for? And then how do we think this thing should look for us to recognize it? And so then obviously I think there is a question around kind of looking at the what are we looking for? If it's actually, I think that actually black queers or black queerness can I exist in all kinds of ways that some of us as black and queer might not even recognize it as being black and queer. And then what happens there? And then and then I'm and and then also thinking and I'm I'm going off slightly there and there has to be room in the conversation around what about then black queers who are they don't want to be archived also and then how I'm do then I'm I account for that as well and and the other kind of spaces that we exist in clubs and bars and nightclubs and da 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 they also are kind of spaces in some kind of way as well so when we have to then I think well actually those other moments cannot be archived but they still can be remembered in all kinds of ways but not 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 in documents in that classical sense and but in the body as a document so then I think there still has to then be these nuanced ways that we even have to talk about this thing called the archive still and so 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 I'm yes it's political but it's also sexual and then it does these other moves as well and then because then I do not think that the sexual and pleasure is separate from the political. I think it's all political. So then once again, I'm I'm I think to me politics and that do not include that element. It's kind of a frigid kind of politic. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um there was something else which you've all kind of touched upon, which is I feel like you've all spoken about the future as well and um i'm thinking about like do you feel like more people it, or at least i feel like it seems like more people have started to think about what an archive is or started to you know put it's it's somehow become more popular and i wonder if if there is maybe something about like imagining different possible black queer futures and what an archive can be if there's some sort of relationship there which is what has suddenly made it more uh, like appealing to more people. I'm well. I'm the the Rickers Archive in part came about it because I I the question that myself and I'm Tuffle was having also was around you know what will happen to the things we've created and when we are no longer here. So actually, I think that there's something for some activists 
about becoming older in the context of the UK, actually what will happen to the stuff so then I think kind of the, the and the archive, I think I'm for some of us, it's through that lens that has come from around aging in the context of the UK. And and I and I I think it's kind of is it popular? It seems like it. <laughs> I but then I'm kind of not always convinced that just because everybody is now using or a lot of folks are using the, the, the word archive. I can always have to come back to what is the work and what is the work that's been done in the name of this in call um, the Black Queer Archive, whether it's physical or theoretical or, or um, conceptual, what is the work and how does it kind of manifest and then I am I for me the the archive is a gift to the black queers yet to come. Yeah. Um so that's how I kind of see the the and the archive. I think it's very much about the future and not the past. Um that's my kind of take around the archive at the moment. I think um for me, uh, this yeah, this question is a this question of uh, futures and futurity is like really important. I think younger people now are, are maybe thinking and considering um, the shape and the form of of the material that will make up their archives, right? And I think cyber feminism, like black um, cyber feminists, are really crucial to that because a lot of our archive will be online. Like a lot of our, yeah, yeah. I, I like joke with friends that like. The things that people will dig up on us will be like panels and and you know notes that we wrote on Google Docs or whatever because so few people write things yeah. with like a pen and paper anymore, right? So there's this question, there's there's interesting questions about like um, how we might play with the form of an archive and how yeah. that we might like undo this idea of um, the archive as final, right? We might um, yeah. in our orientation to it, allow it in line with futurity to unfold and and um, like in front of us, which is quite exciting. But I, I remember also having a conversation with um, Jacob Joyce about um, people being obsessed with chronology in terms of our yeah. history, right? Like people are really invested in a singular story where linear progress marks the movement from point A to point B. And when you start to kind of mess with that, there people, people have really like emotional responses yeah. to it. I think they were talking about like um, uh, drawing, um, uh, uh, painting a mural and maybe putting something that wasn't officially in the history, in the mural. And we got so many kind of visceral responses yeah. from people saying, you're undoing history, you're like blah, blah. But for me, that is a really important um, uh uh, kind of tool that we can use. It has like yeah. political utility, right? To to say, okay, chronology is um, an idea, uh, chronology is a fiction or history as we understand yeah. it is a fiction, right? Somebody wrote like our histories in lots of different ways. And there are loads of ways that history is happening around us. And we won't as black queer people um, appear even as like minor characters. And so yeah. if some has the the kind of like political and historical authority to say this is history we also can not only just make a counter history but we can yeah. mess with that history yes. we, can mess yeah. we can say we can invent things that don't exist and that that is the exciting potential for me of like what we might be able to do with material that we find in the archive how might we extend it how might we fictionalize it how might we yeah. you know, turn it into a piece of visual art whatever that, that on the question of futurity i think the future has to be invented and created and that to me is i guess um yeah what, what i'm interested in and um i love that you are use the word i'm um, invented it was actually I'm I'm I do rather invention rather than discovery. Mm -hmm. Invention just does a different kind of a move. I'm I'm that seems more open, more plastic, yeah. Whereby I discovery has this sociology, anthropology way to enter it, and that doesn't sit well. I'm with me, so yes, I'm 
invent and play with this thing. Yeah. I think something about, I think something that I struggle with this kind of idea about futurity or the, or the future and the way in which the archive is kind of positioned or how it's generally known is that it's very linear. It's like the archive is about the past. You discover it in the, discover it in the present and then it will help the future. And I think the thing is that like, there's, so, I don't think that there's things, I think there's things that have already happened that, will put like it's not like we're going to learn from what's happened in the past to create a new future i think there's things that already happened in the past that are the future right so mm. i wonder how we can treat archives that aren't so that isn't so linear that isn't about this kind of taking to to produce something new like how can we disabuse ourselves of the concept of something new that can be gained from the archive um so yeah i wonder about positioning it not in terms of as Lola was talking about this kind of linear um, progression. And I think fiction is can be a good way of approaching it, but I think in general this kind of perhaps unlearning of, re of a reverence about the, the process of archiving uh, could also be helpful. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point. Also, because I mean, in terms of like institutional archives who created this structure and process in the first place, I think it is important to try and um, unlearn some of that uh, approach anyway. Um, and also something that you said, Lola, just made me think about, there's always these uh, facts which are that are recited again and again and eventually people believe that they're true and then it's like that's not actually the case it's just enough people have said it for it now yeah. to have become yeah. true you know a really good example of this is like um people often recite how many passengers there were on the empire windrush and actually when you see the passenger list it's just proves that actually it's not the case at all but enough people have said it i think it's like 488 or something like this and you know um it was like printed in, in books and, and now you know it's at the point where people are like yes this is a number but it's like no it's not and if you actually start to unravel some of those materials you see that actually that's not the case at all um and then there was one other thing as well which you said mm -hmm. about um cyber feminism and I just wanted to kind of flag as well, you know, thinking about, it's interesting thinking about, you know, what happened this week with like Facebook and stuff, because also when we start to work with these digital spaces, um, you know, where are the materials being held? Who is yes. holding them? Can we trust, can we trust that they're still gonna be on those servers in 20 years time and that anybody's still, you know, even the people who they're concerning, can we trust that, they're even still going to be able to access that stuff, you know. So um, it sort of raises new questions around, like, or raises different questions around access and, um, yeah, just knowing that the the materials are being saved in some. In yeah, some way. yeah. I, I, I think for me, I, it's access, and but it's I ownership. Who actually owns it? when it's on these platforms. And I think actually, I'm, I'm, I think there is a, a danger if we only think that that's the only way that people can access our Black Queer archives is to put it online. I'm absolutely, really, I'm, I'm, because I'm who owns it once it's there. And, and actually, a lot of us don't read those small print anyway. So after then, and, and for me, there is a long history of I'm, I'm work being created around a black British queer experiences and but the black queers don't own that material and that's why I feel like we need to rethink how how things archive documented kept who buy and so on and so forth that for me I'm I'm is I'm important and I'm as I'm someone who loves paper and materials and books and da, da, da. I'm sometimes going back to the institutions 
they also have the skills to look after that stuff because I don't need them. So then once again, it's this push pull I'm happening and but I'm I'm kind of not I think I'm resistant to always run towards shiny. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think mm, actually it's because basically I still believe that the conversations around a black British queer experience, a black queer archives in the context of the UK is still quite a new conversation. And so and as so basically I'm still me I still have conversations and we focus around what black queer history, what does it look like? The, the, so actually I don't think that we need to lose sight of those conversations and those things that people still have in their houses, in their homes. And so, and so I for me as an archive, as an archivist, I would love to see more joined up thinking around the collecting of black queer archival work. I think though that I wonder if I don't know. I still check my live journal, and it's surprising yeah. it's still here. <laughs> <laughs> my 15, fifteen year old musings are still online, but I, yeah, I don't really trust that they're gonna re- that these kind of multinational conglomerates are gonna keep stuff that I that I write or talk about like in 20 years. I I really don't think that's going to be the case. But I wonder if that means going back to what you were saying about like the sensuality or the tactility. What about conceiving of archives broader than like documents, than video? Like what if we thought about the archive, really thought about what it means that archives are in our bodies? Yes. Really allowed that to be like a way in which we thought about archiving or a way in which we turned away from... I'm not really sure that these institutions or these like very normative ways of doing things in terms of archives and how they've been done for a really long time are kind of the answer for a black queer yeah. archive. I think it has to exist in a different form. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm interested in like yeah expanding what archives mean mm-hmm. and where how mm-hmm. they can be present in different spaces in different materials that allows to kind of bypass these ideas, these kind of complicated politics of ownership and accessibility. I think mm-hmm. also that like queer life is is um, in many ways underpinned by legibility, right? So trying to fit back into those institutions is never gonna work. I guess from the, from the cyber feminists, we take like tools of encryption, like ways that we might hide, ways that we might escape the traps of like kind of online spaces. But I think what you're both saying, at least for me, takes us back to to this idea of like, um, yeah, like disabusing ourselves that like an official archive must be held by an institution, right? Like what is the basement? What is like some under somebody's bed? And, and what possibility does that open up for us for thinking about like, the, the archives that are uh, kind of contained within it. And I think about the differences between, I think about like DIY collections processes yeah. versus like the, the collections process of the um, the institution. And just the difference between a, a grassroots DIY archive where you can go and, and be tactile with the material, where you can go and ask questions and pick it up and put it down and a kind of uh, a more official quote unquote official archive where you have to wear gloves and you can't you know you have to use pencils and stuff like that and I think that in many ways the future is a movement away from those institutions towards more DIY practices again which were I think which in, in lots of ways contained and continue to contain the most interesting material I'm convinced that like you know this the state is not holding like the real stuff you know or these institutions are not holding um what is most politically threatening in some sense or, or what might you know um shift us in in um the most basically i think for me i'm i it's got to be both those things just so that i'm 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 it because i think for me sometimes there is a, a around danger of saying the institution is is evil uh, it's my words, and then somehow your black queer t- DIY, and we can build this romantic notion around that as well. As so actually, I think that we need to kind of like move away from either or to both and. And so, then, uh, it, because then, uh, it, because then, I'm, 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 I think to me, there is different learnings from both those things. As I'm, 
as I am someone who's I moved the archive from other one's bed into the institution, I can move in them between both those and they see the pluses, the pluses and minuses of both those kind of I'm 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 approaches to the archive and yeah. Yeah, I just I just wanted to just throw that into the mix. Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions now. I'm just having a look in the chat. I, I'm not sure if there's any questions at the moment, but if anyone wants to put a question out there, you can just uh, write in the chat and we can bring it into the conversation. But yeah, I feel like mm, I can I can understand what you're saying about this um, it needing to be inside and outside of those spaces. But I I just love this idea of thinking about if we if we have the tools to to make the Black Queer Archive as we see it need need it needed to be. What does that look like? Um, yeah. Um, there's one from uh, Michael Riley. I'm developing a national exhibition on the history of black British music. What would you suggest is the best approach to researching and profiling the black British queer contribution? Speak to your black queer artists from the 70s, 80s, 90s and 2000. First and foremost, <laughs> that's it. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not the person to ask ab about music, but I would say, I think in the in the framing of the exhibition, try or, or or experiment with not trying to tell a story of you know the history of of Black British music. I, I think yes. that that. that already places you in a, in a more interesting starting point and then you might be able to pick up threads where you find them and also I, I would say keep an eye out for um, uh, those people that aren't mentioned I guess or those people that are mentioned once or twice here or there like that the, the people for whom you you maybe can't find as much material maybe have more interesting stories yeah. or maybe have you know stories that were um, defined by you know, oppression or, or, or yeah, defined by um, their marginalization from specific scenes and whatever. I think that for me is where the interest should lie for you, maybe. And I think then there is a question around, uh, uh, if it's then Black British music, and then also, uh, it's then not just the, the, the singers, uh, but would that then include producers, record labels, and then also there is a question around actually, will I, some of those people just be black? If we're talking about black British music, exactly. If I'm, let's say, so, someone there then writes around, let's say, a black British queer music scene, a club scene, could that then include your white club promoters? I'm just throwing that into a mix. If then, once again, these things, I'm not always going to be clear cut. If you know, once again, I come back to who's excluded from that, not who's included. So we have another question from Danny Ebanks Ingram. Um, what do you think isn't being seen yet in archives around the Black British? Oh, child. <laughs> I was going to ask this question. <laughs> I, I have got to go towards, we're not hearing the stories of your black kingsters, your black sex workers, those unruly black queer folks and those unruly black queer bodies. Because I'm, I think that the more that LGBT history, including some aspects of black history, then it becomes mainstreamed, yeah? 
as if there is a whole question around how I'm are we using, using the word mainstream, I think that those histories become more palatable and cleaned up and sanitized. And then once again, certain kind of black narratives of black experiences are excluded. And from that, I'm, it's because I'm gonna say I'm, that I think that some of our own black queer politics is kind of respectability politics also. So we have then need to have then that other conversation about who do we also exclude as black queer archivists in those narratives. So then I kind of always go to those sexual bodies and the sexual black queer bodies gets missing, including pornography and, and then those personal items that we keep from lovers and fuck buddies, whatever, that stuff you normally get, get excluded is because the Black Queer Archive usually looks through a social cultural lens. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a mainly framed around the activism or the events. And but actually, I think that where I'm, a lot of the interesting conversations can really can, can happen is around those personal things that we keep and hold dear to us. Yeah, I think the ordinary or the everyday doesn't get yeah. it. Yes, you're right. right. It's always about the first yes. or the exceptional yes. Yes. people. Yes. And that, that yeah, that means that, yeah, the everyday is ignored and yes. what's underneath the kind of public sphere often gets ignored as well. I mean, I just generally think that if you keep on hearing the same names that people I agree, then there's a problem. <laughs> We need to be looking beyond the kind of familiar names that we've he heard before and trying to dig a little bit deeper. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Totally. I think also there is a movement just to, to kind of echo what Ajami says to kind of, I guess, um, yeah, take the sex out of queer life or, or to present queer life in a very kind of like within a very heteronormative frame, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and in doing that, a lot of what I think is most threatening about queers is, is, is black queers especially is lost in in that retelling of the story where we're, we're trying to appease the mainstream or we're trying to like a john said like um gain some respect or gain some respectability from mainstream institutions and stuff like that so I think a lot of that is lost and and we also see that in cultural production and in, in the story like queer stories right they're often yeah. devoid of like as we've spoken about like pleasure they're devoid of like a real um sense of being tactile with each other because that's yeah. still something that's that threatens um some parts of the world that we live in etc so yeah. i think that yeah that's something that's also missing as well. yes i agree i agree i also just wanted to add about you know because we spoke a bit about messiness before as well i kind of think about yeah people as well who are messy you know a certain kind of messiness and how this could be related also sometimes to like mental health and um you know that not only having people who are like necessarily charismatic or like reliable yeah. narrators or like yeah that sort of like neat story um you know maybe someone who was a bit of a mess and maybe wasn't like um very likable um that you don't you know to to appreciate someone's history you don't have to necessarily um like them if that makes sense it makes perfect sense. I, there was a project I was involved in a few years ago around our cover project, and there was one person who I don't like them. All right, no names mentioned, but I just do not like this person. Messy as fuck, basically. However, I could not discount the work that they did. Yeah. And then sometimes I would have to do that move to say, well, actually, I don't like you personally, but your work around a black queer experience cannot be discounted. So then they were involved in this event. <laughs> I kept my distance. <laughs> However, and then sometimes and we have to include those people and we just have to do that move also. Um, we have another question, which is from uh, Sue Lemos. What about the oral archive and oral history? Also, can we speak about the difference across periods and even regions and beyond the West? Uh, 
I mean, I think archives definitely mean different things in different places. Um, and I can only like really speak to what archives mean from like a British perspective, really. Yeah. But I definitely encountered the difference, like going to, I was doing a project that was kind of looking at archives in Nigeria and people were just like, what are you interested in this old stuff for? <laughs> it's like a completely different relationship to yeah. the past because of what the past meant and because of a more future focused kind of society. Um, but that that was just a one experience that I had and I don't know if it tracks more generally. But so yeah, there's de there's definitely a difference um, in how they, what they mean, how they're treated, how what preservation looks like, what archives look like, how the buildings are, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of differences. Um, in terms of the oral archive and oral history, I think that, as I have said about like expanding the notion of archives beyond documents and things like that, I think that's really, for me, that's been quite in my work of trying to use these um, colonial film archives as a starting point, but try and transform them in some way or get them to kind of behave um, in a way that was contrary to their kind of origins and the intentions behind making them, the oral became quite important, but also just the body, like how is the body mm. an archive? How is a gesture an archive? Mm. And how can that communicate? So I think that's kind of how I've thought about using other ways of knowing, other approaches to um, how to make meaning in archival work. I think, um, yeah, on the question of um, oral histories, much of, I think when you when you come from a violent history, oral histories are in, incredibly important and like memories and bodies are where um, our, our notions of the world are stored, right? Or our, experience are, uh, our experiences are stored. But I, I would say also that my experience, even of contemporary queer life, is of the story, is of like, this is what happened. And, you know, this may, be not be this may not be written down somewhere or this may not be recorded in a quote unquote official way, but here's the gossip, here's what happened, right? And so I think that, yeah, I think this is an excellent question in directing us to the importance of voice, in it, the importance of telling stories, the importance of the construction of narratives, even in the most quotidian spaces, right? Even in, you know, the space of the cafe or the club, yeah. or, you know, in the park with a friend. Those are spaces in which like, um, I guess the weaving of histories is is happening and happens in front of us. It's, it's, I think the question in relation to archives becomes about, you know, how do we record that or what, what happens or how do we make sure that it exists? But in the moment that is a, like exactly what is happening in the same way that when people recall memories from different periods or when they recall memories of uh, spaces that they weren't in, um, we are in, in, like I said before, encountering a specific history. It just doesn't feel that way because it's understood through the lens of a conversation. And we don't have, often we don't have evidence of it, right? Because we don't record every single conversation yeah. we have, but that's still in, in lots of ways, I believe still a meaningful encounter. And I think on the question of like, thinking about archives like across regions, I think that so much of official archiving practice um, is uh, kind of um, centered around where money flows in terms of like local authority and government. So obviously you tend to have like uh, archives in um, the capitals of places, right? Or archives yeah, in yeah. places where money flows into. And you're absolutely, again, this is a really great um, question in thinking in underfunded regions, how do we do, how do we go about the archiving, um, that archiving practice when the state literally has abandoned um, its responsibility to keep the histories of those people that live there. And that often is, again, through oral histories, it is through things that slip through our fingers. And so I think it's like, yeah, it's, a, it's very, it's difficult to pin down and like give a like a concrete answer, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question. 
which is from uh, Brit Bombasian. Hi. <laughs> um, Hi, lovely. So, <laughs> what is being actually done currently to capture what's out there, under beds, et cetera? Who's recording oral histories? It's a good question. Um, can I add that I, I think it's important that we all record or capture uh, our history and then uh, and then that work is then not just left to people like us who are called ourselves archivists after that actually it's up to people to record and save what they've been creating really that's how it should be because I think there is a danger of I'm leaving it up to one or two people trying to do that work it's it's a massive and it, it's just one massive piece of work to record this thing called Black Queer History in the context of the UK. So then actually, I think that there has to be a wider conversation that you know, how do everybody... It, because actually, most people are actually are archiving their, their experiences through throughout the archives in their back pocket anyway, right? Yeah, and they probably don't call it archiving. I'm just capturing myself jumping around the club. I so actually, I think that we need to think, you know, that everyone is responsible for doing this kind of work, not just a few of us. I'm, I'm, it's because that's not possible. That is my take on the question. Yeah, we are, we all should be, ideally. I think it also like shifts us towards maybe a more collective orientation towards archiving, like you're saying, so so it doesn't just become the work of um, the archivist or the work of the yeah, person yeah. Whose, whose job it is to collect those materials. I also think that um, a fragmentary approach to understanding history um, really takes us away from this idea that everything might be recorded in its totality and put in one yeah. place. I think mm -hmm. understanding that like, even if material doesn't make it into an official archive and does remain under someone's bed, it still has meaning. It still has yes. purpose. It still exists within the wider kind of um, uh, uh, network of archives that we're kind of mentioning. And I think that, yeah, I think perhaps in a way, um, a more interesting question is like, what's being done with that material or where does that material go or how do we how do we go about connecting the threads between the material that is is um contained in state archives or contained in institutional archives and that material under the bed how do we forge those connections right and what's the difference in those histories and the trajectories of those histories and how they're able to to um travel or carry you know or who can access them Onyeka, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I think they've said it both really well. <laughs> um, I do think as well, it's quite interesting thinking about some of these digital platforms. Like I'm thinking about TikTok um, and, you know, someone actually has said in the chat, I think it was uh, Tiff Webster, you know, we can't rely on these uh, social platforms to do the archiving. But I do think it's really interesting sometimes to see how these platforms change um, people's perceptions of what is of value or like, um, or what can be documented, if that makes sense. Like, I think about how much comedy, for example, has or like certain types of comedy has come out of the fact that people are now using TikTok and it starts all of these different trends. And so then it kind of changes what people feel needs to be documented or like what kind of stories need to be created. And I think that that's really interesting. And I'm not sure if there's necessarily a question in it, but just kind of, yeah, thinking about how does maybe something around what role does technology play in shaping um, what, suddenly seems important if that makes sense mm. um yeah this is this is a diff this is a real difficult question especially as a lot of these platforms are emerging, you know, in the contemporary moment, and we're learning new things about what they do to us, our relation to others, etc. Um, 
I try not to to have like a, a real technophobia. There's a way that, that you could answer this question that really doesn't take into account the levels of kind of like creativity and also experimentation that happens on these platforms. But also there's a materialist element of me that's like, these are owned by, you know, these multinational like corporations. And so there is an incentive in terms of how their um, like short form content, especially is like kind of being created. But I guess on the question of technology, I think for me, it comes back to this question of like, in terms of the material that we're archiving or the material that we're placing on these platforms, we are yet to know the full scope of yeah. I think, the extent of like st surveillance, right? And I think we have we have some sense of that, you know, our, our monetary purchases or um, in many ways our organizing is being tracked. But I think less so than the question of like, what do these platforms offer is more, how do we ensure that as these platforms exist, yeah. we can stay safe um, and yeah. we can yeah. keep information encoded and encrypted so that when, that that is kind of um, necessary in terms of the the archival material that we're collecting, whatever we can put it in a space that we can come back to. Should we yeah. need to take them off these platforms, right? Yes. And I think that, that, that is a question that actually a lot of young people don't know. It's certainly a question that I I have to constantly ask myself and have to find out more. But I think that also shows us that the archive is not just a conceptual thing, right? It's under it's yeah. underpinned by all of these material things that direct us. Um, in 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 many ways towards like particular violences or um, towards like surveillance or towards whatever, and we have to do our best actually to yeah. to claw that back from those entities that want to take it from us, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad also, Lola, that you brought up surveillance because I think it is also important to mention that. Um, you know, whether it's physical or digital, there's lots of collections or materials that have come about through surveillance as well, that, you know, some of the records that people might consider to be important now are only there because of, of, of a certain type of violence that has already taken place. And it feels important to name that. I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to check the chat and see if there's any more questions. I was gonna say, that's a really good point, I think, Rudy, but also it reminds me of like this question that sometimes I come up against is like, how can you sh like show some care to the people that are kind of captured by the archive? Yes. So if it is this kind of situation where you know the material has been gained in a particular way, like what can be done when using it or thinking through it to, yeah, show some kind of care to those people? There's a question specifically for you, Ajamu, which is, um, can you talk about the relationship between archives and studio photography for you? Mm. Can I talk about that? I, I think I'm that, I think that, I think that the actual studio is an archival moment in a sense that the conversations can lead to the images that I might then take of the person who is front of the camera. I'm so 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 I'm while I'm I'm while I'm a lot of my work and deals with you know fine art photography, I've also been systematically documenting a black queer Britain whether in terms of events or I'm inside the studio as so actually I'm I'm they are linked I'm I'm I I I'm not sure if I have a clear idea in how they're linked I'm, but I just I know that actually that the studio is the space that I'm able to record these moments that I have with I'm some amazing black queer folks. Three of them are photographed on this <laughs> here already. I thought I'm 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 I think everything that I do is connected to the archive is because I'm trying to hold some kind of memory or experience and studio practice is part of that. Um, I think kind of that's the best way I could um respond to that question at the moment. Um, I'm just also thinking, Ajami, about what happens when 
you know, you have these amaz amazing, beautiful images of, of people from the community. And also, you know, as people are passing away, how suddenly the uh, significance or importance of those images kind of changes, the weight of them changes in some way. Yeah, well, I, 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 it kind of changes in, 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 in the sense that I'm, while I'm, I get time, a lot of joy from taking pictures, keeping the work of the decades. I'm sometimes there, 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 there is a sadness and that comes with the archive, is but then also there's people who are no longer here that I managed to capture. 20, 30 years ago, I so actually, I'm, 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 my, I'm, I, I, my feelings around the archive kind of changes de depending on the image that I'm engaged with. And then sometimes, sorry, sometimes it's the same image that can bring joy and sadness within seconds of each other as well. So, it's, I always come back to pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And sometimes I'm like, oh my God, Ricky's not here. I have to see uh, these fabulous young queens 30 plus years later jumping around. If because then I then look at some of your amazing younger queens, I think this would have been the daughter of Ricky. <laughs> so then once again, the, the archive, all their contact sheets, all the prints, I'm, I'm, and does that kind of move for me? I just move in between those emotions. Um, yeah. Thank you. And a question for Lola. Um, you mentioned the fickleness of archives in your preface to the new edition of the Claudia Jones biography. How did you find reflecting on the book in 2021 with all the holes that it has? I think, um, yeah, this is a really, interesting question because well, yeah I, I think what's interesting about the book is that it, it's made up of these fragments in a way like um in the way that the book is constructed I don't think it's attempting to give a kind of total overview of um Claudia Jones's life and I don't and I think it knows that it can't do that and I think often when you're reading a biography that is the um, that is the stated point of the text that you're reading, right? To to tell us everything that we know. But I think at, at lots of points, this text tells us, well, we don't really know what she was thinking here, or who her friendships were, or how she would have felt about this person saying this thing about her. And that, to me, um, really expands and and gives texture to her life, right? Because it, it reminds us that actually figures in the past are not people we have. Um, exclusive access to. There are lots of things about people's lives that we don't and shouldn't know, right? Yeah. Um, and how can we take um, her kind of like political organizing work um, and how can we use that, you know, in in the work that we're doing, how, how can we use it to shore up our own determination, etc. cetera. Um, and it, I think it also raises the question of, um, of like, what is it important to know about Claudia Jones, right? Yeah. Is it important to know that she's a communist, that she was a communist? Is it important to know that she she endeavored to work collectively, et cetera? Um, yeah, and, and those kind of personal elements of her, her life or the, the holes in it, those are spaces where as audiences, I think in the book, we're asked to sit with being uncomfortable, right? We're, we're asked to sit with this idea that actually, why should we know this information about her, yeah, right? And yeah. if we did, how would that change our understanding um, like to her so in ways it was it was nice to read a, a book that was laid out in that sense that was trying to give a sense of Claudia from from everyone who knew her in some sense right so there are snippets and stories and for me that's that's an example of uh, what a fragmentary approach can do mm. how it can mm. yeah how it can um uh, make us think about you know the past yeah great thank you um just see if there's any other questions. Any final questions? One more. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else you would like to just uh, finally add? Anything that you're that you're doing at the moment that feels you'd like to just share in the space? 
I was going to say, Rudy, I know that you do lots of work on archives. <laughs> 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 and I kind of think that yeah, be I'm maybe you can talk a little bit about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I agree. I have, I have been doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, well, I was up until gosh, what even where where are we? Who knows? What year is it? Um, up some up until some point this year, um, I was working with one nine eight Contemporary mm. Arts and Learning. Um, with um, my colleague Eleni on creating the formal archive for the, mm -hmm. for their space, um, and actually, yeah, the you know they've been having um, refurbishments at the, at the building for the last couple of years, really. But um, yeah, so it's finally reopening, and so there's going to be a new study room, um, which we have kind of helped to create and yeah the the materials will be there in their formal structure um and i've also painted a timeline it's beautiful of every, it's of beautiful. every exhibition that has ever been there it's i mean beautiful. again yeah. hopefully that every hopefully yeah. everything is included but i'm sure there's some holes because you know it's just what was actually included in the materials yeah. um but yeah you know it's like 30 years of exhibitions so you can mm. see that in the space um, I've also been working with um, Multitudes Co-op on a project called Black Digital Archiving Project um, and that has also um, is going to launch this month mm. and uh, Ajamu was one of the guests on the podcast for that so hopefully that will be accessible soon um, and I've also just started doing this PhD at um, University Arts London which also involves um, some archival material from the National Archives. So yeah, just, <laughs> just you know, just hustling, just hustling. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you all so much. You said just so many pearls of wisdom. I've literally just started writing stuff down. And I was like, this is just, yeah, just so many good things, so many um, thoughts to, to process um, from everything that you said. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, for being part of this space and thank you Jamana for offering us this space to have this conversation um yeah just it's been really wonderful to be in conversation with you all thank you thank you, so much. Thank you lovely thank you Jamana do you need to say anything to wrap up or no okay all right well thank you everybody for listening in